and welcome to Rise of the Custodians. My name is Dave Middleton, a senior manager within EY's national office focusing on blockchain, and I will be moderating today's discussion. I am pleased to be joined by Nathan McCauley, CEO and co-founder of Anchorage, Jared Shaw, head of internal audit at Gemini, and Paul McIntosh, an EY advisory partner who serves many of our digital asset clients. Gentlemen, I'll now ask each of you to expand briefly on your backgrounds. Nathan? Hi everyone, I'm uh, Nathan McCauley, co-founder and CEO of Anchorage, um, a digital asset custodian. Uh, very, very focused on security and the usability of the assets. Uh, so can you hold your assets safely within a custodial provider and use them in all the ways that you want to be able to use blockchain-based assets? Really treating assets, um, rather than as bearer instruments, treating them as software. And allowing you to um, really achieve all the use cases that you would like to um, out of crypto assets, whether it comes to staking, governance, voting, any kind of participation. Uh, that's what we focus on and that's where, uh, where we find our, our bread and butter. Uh, we serve uh, primarily and only institutional clients. Uh, so think your crypto hedge funds, uh, traditional asset managers, uh, venture capital funds, and increasingly are um, looking at use cases around being an infrastructure provider for other folks looking to build crypto businesses on top of our rails. Fantastic and welcome, Jared. Thanks Dave. Hi everybody, I'm Jared Shaw and I'm the head of internal audit at Gemini. Uh, Gemini is a uh, full service digital asset uh, exchange and custodian. So we focus on a lot of the same things that Nathan uh, went over as far as storage of digital assets, but we also provide a retail and institutional exchange for liquidity uh, on various digital assets. Um, we are a New York State uh, trust licensed institution um, operating in the US uh, and in several um, international locations. Um, prior to coming to Gemini, uh, I've been with the firm for about a year. I worked at EY actually, um, so great to see you all again. Um, for about eight years focusing on fintech and cryptocurrency startups. Uh, and then prior to that, uh, did my time in the traditional financial services industry at, uh, at Goldman Sachs. Thanks for having me. Very nice. And, and Paul? Hey, thanks, Dave. Uh, Paul McIntosh. I'm a, a partner based in San Francisco. Um, for the last 20 or so years, I've been working in the banking capital markets, uh, wealth and asset management space. In the last few years, focusing more on, on cryptocurrency exchanges and, and digital asset blockchain companies. So primarily giving uh, accounting technical advice and, and advice around um, internal controls. So leveraging a lot of our traditional financial services experience and seeing how that can be leveraged in the, uh, in the blockchain company space. So glad to be here today, Dave. Appreciate it. Uh, for those in attendance, please feel free to submit questions for our panelists using the Q&A functionality and we'll leave time at the end of this session to address as many of them as possible. Now, we'll jump right into the first phase of questions for our panelists. As storage and security services for digital assets have become a primary market demand in recent years, one of the key questions from customers that commonly arises is whether or not their digital assets held in third-party custody are secure. So Jared, can you discuss certain of the recent shortcomings that we've seen in the market where digital assets were not secure? And additionally, perhaps you can talk about the mechanisms in place to prevent theft or loss of the private keys to the digital assets. Sure, yeah, absolutely. And you know, we're, we're talking about custody here. So safeguarding and secure storage of assets are absolutely the most critical aspect involved. And the cryptocurrency industry, digital assets have been, uh, have had no shortage of, let's just call it lack of confidence in that space given the fact that there have been very high profile hacks and loss of assets, Mt. Gox, um, Quadriga being uh, a couple of those. Um, you know, so there are multiple vectors for uh, bad actors to, to try to maliciously uh, get access to both online stored digital assets and uh, you know, offline physically stored digital assets. And that's actually the interesting component about it is that unlike other FinTech um, sectors, cryptocurrency has the unique aspect of having both a technology component on one hand from, from storing digital assets online, but then also it has this very physical operational component to storing digital assets 
in what we would call cold storage uh, offline. And, and that combination is, I think, very unique to digital assets and something that requires a whole new set of, um, of implementing controls and layers of protections for securing those assets. Um, so, so really, we Gemini is very focused on. And I know, I know Nathan at Anchorage is as well. Is kind of trying to improve the level of trust in the industry based on the the various levels of of securing assets that we have on our platform. Um, uh, that that road that path to really earning trust is a long one, and and it's one we that you know at Gemini we think we're we're a forefront or a forerunner on. Um, part of what we've done is to, to just really build a system that has as many layers as possible of controls. And, and then when you think you have enough layers of controls in place, you add more layers. Um, part of that in the last couple of years has been acquiring um, insurance on our, both our online hot wallet uh, storage solutions and our, and our offline cold wallet solutions. And I think the industry has broadly moved towards acquiring insurance. Um, and that's also been a, you know, a climb um, from the sense that it's getting insurers comfortable with our platform and, and how it uh, is secure and safe. Um, and, and so we've seen kind of this race to the top of custodians getting more and more levels of insurance to cover their assets. Again, with the focus on really just trying to obtain as much trust as possible from the marketplace um, around the storage. So we've also done things like um, uh, having external certifications of our platform. So whether that's in the form of a SOC 1 or a SOC 2 assessment um, or having additional cybersecurity, AML, BSA reviews around our platform, all of those things are done to, to, to demonstrate that our platform is as secure as possible. And that's just going to largely become table stakes for the industry. Um, and so, so we're really excited about being at the forefront of that. And, um, and we're, we're looking forward to, for, for the rest of the industry to continue on that path. Thank you, Jared. That was a great overview. In terms of the security of digital assets, Nathan, perhaps you can discuss what new and innovative solutions are being developed. And do you have a preliminary sense of how the regulators are reacting to these solutions? Sure, so I think it's, um, I think it's a, a really interesting area to talk about security, talk about um, assets and how we, how we use them and how we think about them. Um, in many ways, uh, you know, was, I caught a little bit of the last session where we were talking about um, stable coins um, and you start talking about stable coins, you start talking about utility tokens, and then uh, crypto, cryptocurrencies like a, like a Bitcoin and Ethereum. There's, there's just so much going on that it is in many ways a, an irreducibly complex problem to think about how does all of this fit into a, a regulatory structure. So I might just table the regulatory discussion for a moment uh, to talk a little bit about security. Um, on, the, on the topic of security, uh, we at Anchorage want digital assets to end up being able to be treated uh, like any other asset, or in many ways, we, we think that we ought to be able to be better than uh, the, uh, the usability profile that you have with cash, usability profile that you have with stocks, uh, and the usability profile you have with bonds and other kinds of, uh, other kinds of assets. Um, and so our, our view here is that um, if we're going to take this digital transformation, we should actually have things end up being better. Uh, it should be seamless to be able to in, uh, integrate uh, custody solutions into uh, another offering. It should be seamless to settle crypto uh, between different counterparties. It should be seamless to um, utilize your crypto in ways. Um, if, we're, if we're just gonna have all um, assets like Bitcoin that are, are stores of value but don't really do much, uh, then there, is, there are appropriate ways to secure those, um, so secure those coins. But where things get really interesting is what if you actually want to use the crypto assets? Take, for example, Maker with a multi-collateral DAI system. Uh, moving Maker to a multi-collateral DAI system required a vote. Uh, what that vote required was actually using the private key of the Maker token in order to uh, 
express an intent in the same way that you might do a uh, a vote in a um, in a proxy voting kind of setting. Um, our clients needed to vote with their maker keys, uh, and that that requires a a level of security that is unmatched in other other kinds of assets and is unmatched in um, really in 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 the bleeding edge of what's going on in, in crypto right now, um, because you need to you need to very quickly be able to access that key multiple times uh, in order to uh, effectuate that vote. And so, our starting point uh, with how to secure the assets was uh, not just how can we um, put in the most um, most difficult set of processes to protect the assets. But really, how can we how can we make sure that if you're prof properly authenticated, you can move your assets within minutes, you can vote with your assets within minutes, uh, you can do automated staking, uh, such that your your staking system works as seamlessly as your stock dividend system might work. Um, and so we really think that what what helps this whole space move forward is multiple capable custodians. Uh, that are able to really uh, push the envelope on what is possible in terms of uh, security and usability. Coming back to the question on regulation, regulation is uh, super important, and one of the one of the best things for regulation is for there to be multiple good options. If there are multiple good options, then regulators can start to see the patterns between them and take those patterns and say, okay, this one's working here, this one's working here, um, and how do we how do we move forward? Uh, what's interesting in financial regulation as opposed to other regulations is that um, financial regulation doesn't really have a kind of um, experiment, try it out, and then uh, see what wins kind of approach. Uh, many regulators want to get educated before uh, rolling out any kind of regulatory regime uh, and then update as it goes. And so what you're seeing in the, at least in the regulatory landscape in the U.S., is a state-by-state -state, uh, rollout of regulations where people are figuring things out in anticipation, we all believe, of eventually some sort of federal regulations being able to um, be uh, executed. Um, and so typical licensures right now are um, state money transmitter licenses or trust company licenses, both of which end up having a pretty significant security component where you need to let the, the state, state regulators know, hey, what is the security process here? In addition to what is the financial process, in addition to what is the settlement process, um, capitalization, all of those things kind of, kind of come into play. Uh, and so what's, what's so interesting here is that like so much of this uh, is a, a build out uh, that gets people comfortable. Um, and it's exciting. There's a lot of things that are uh, totally, totally new in this space. Um, there is no existing regulation to follow if you're talking about an asset that is also software that has smart contract um, type uh, interfaces there. Um, there is no uh, well understood insurance market that understands how to underwrite uh, the risk of using the smart contracts in that network. Uh, so there's there's still a lot of work to do, and what's really nice to see is that uh, a bunch of the custodial providers are lo are looking at ways to look to get work together, um, come to come to regulators with like working solutions uh, that are safe and that are usable, and that are secure. And so it's a it's a really exciting time to be in crypto. Uh, really feel like we're at we're getting close to an inflection point on what is possible within custodians and that'll that'll allow kind of the, the second layer of businesses to get built on top of all this. Thanks, Nathan. Very informative. So Paul, with the mechanisms in place that Jared mentioned, we've seen a number of custodians heading down the path of issuing stock reports. Can you discuss where the broader industry stands on this topic? And if you think this is something that will become more commonplace, especially considering challenges that external audit firms are facing surrounding existence when an entity's digital assets are held in third-party custody within commingled wallets? Paul, you're muted. Paul, hey, Paul, you're muted. Thanks, thanks Jared. <laughs> Come on now, rookie mistake. <laughs> I know, guys, I know. <laughs> it, it, it was 10 seconds of um, astounding commentary. So um, I, I was just saying you know, that stock reporting, that system and organization controls reports, um, these are issued by, by various companies and there's an auditor attestation to it. So I think a few folks have mentioned, you know, a key component in the ecosystem, it's, it's trust. 
Um, and so how do you provide trust in the ecosystem for the controls that are supposed to be operating at, at various entities? So one way to do it is via these, these, these SOC reports. So we typically see a few types of these, you know, a SOC 1 report is more focused around controls over financial reporting. Um, a little bit broader than that, you can have things like digital asset valuation covered, um, you know, customer complaints, you know, digital asset storage, all the things a customer of, of, of these digital asset companies may, might be looking for. Um, and then there's a stock two report, you know, which focuses more on security and privacy. Um, and there's a stock three report more intended for general general audiences. So, um, so I think in general, the industry is moving towards those. I think as a barometer for the maturity cycle of, of companies is whether they're issuing, you know, these kind of attestations, providing the marketplace with, with assurance. So Nathan was commenting on the regulatory environment. And the one thing regulators would like to see in addition to investors is, you know, there's this kind of independent attestation and you see companies move along the maturity cycle from you know, tech startups into more established companies, particularly in the, in the financial services space, issuing these, these kind of reports. So I think we're going to see a lot more of it um, for investor confidence and, and, and things like that. Thanks, Paul. Um, and, and I can touch on, I think it leads into your next question as well, Dave, around um, co-mingling mingling of assets. So one of the challenges we typically face as, as audit firms, so we need to independently validate the existence of digital assets. That sometimes becomes problematic um, when a third party provider um, is, is storing those assets. We're using a third party vendor for, for transacting um, because typically, um, you know, there's, there's one public address which might house the digital assets of multiple entities. So for us as auditors, we go in and we're trying to audit a specific um, firm. Um, those assets are commingled. So it's very, very difficult to identify the specific assets related to an individual entity. Um, in addition to that, not all the transactions might be recorded as well. So you know, for example, if, if multiple companies are using a third party vendor and company A wants to buy one Bitcoin and company B wants to sell one Bitcoin, that third party provider in all likelihood isn't going to the public blockchain and buying and selling one, one Bitcoin either way. What they'll do is they'll have a, a separate set of books and records, you know, they, they manage for themselves, um, similar to a stock record and a broker dealer. And they'll just record the transactions on that individual um, ledger. So um, for independent audit firms like us, it's, it's very difficult to go to the blockchain or impossible to go to the blockchain in this instance and see that transaction happening. Um, so what do we do? So this all ties back into the overall control process. So we often look to see if they, is there a SOC 1 type 2 report, meaning are there controls over financial reporting, which indicate there's this, and for want of a better term, this digital asset ledger that's being kept. What are the controls around that? Has that been tested? Has that report went out to the public? Or well, there might be some additional substantive procedures we perform over, you know, um, withdrawals, deposits, you know, old school confirmations, um, things like that. Um, but I think most importantly, what we would look to, to see is the controls that the company themselves have implemented in, in this space. Thanks, Paul. It definitely sounds like stock reports could potentially be useful in the future as it relates to overcoming some of these challenges. So, Jared, building on this topic, can you provide some insights on the controls third-party custodians may have in place around the commingling of digital assets and whether or not these controls are currently being described in SOC reports across the industry? Yeah, sure. So, so, uh, so Paul gave a great overview of some of the challenges and the way that uh, exchanges operate with digital assets. Um, kind of from what we think, what we think about from a traditional broker dealer standpoint, as a, kind of an omnibus and sub accounting uh, relationship. Um, and without getting too in the weeds on that, um, it, it is something that, that we're very focused on. And from a SOC perspective, let me talk about that first. So we would, um, you know, the, the, a SOC 1 and a SOC 2 provide uh, assurance to our customers um, that we are securing their assets, uh, handling, um, uh, their funds appropriately, and then also reporting to them accurately um, so that they can rely on the accuracy of the information that, that we're providing them. Um, and uh, part of that is making sure that we can appropriately account for their assets. Um, so our SOC uh, reports do 
look at the controls we have in place to make sure we're accurately reporting to our customers. Um, and we think that's, again, kind of trust is an overall theme here. That's a really important thing to be um, as transparent as possible with our customers around in order to build that trust. Um, and so that would include controls around um, how we reconcile to various blockchains to, to prove that assets are in existence. It would include controls around <clears throat> how, we, how we manage and reconcile between customer accounts and omnibus firm accounts. Um, and so, so that level of transparency is definitely a, addressed by a SOC. And if you're a, if you're a customer out there <clears throat> of, of a crypto custodian or exchange and you're not seeing that included in a SOC report, then you need to be going back and asking why it's not there or if they even have controls in place. Um, so it's, it's, it's super important. I would say <clears throat> we also, you know, from a business model standpoint, crypto has evolved, I think, from, from years ago where um, some of the original exchanges held a bunch of assets, uh, digital assets on their balance sheet and provided liquidity in the, into the market, into their exchange in order to facilitate buyers and sellers, kind of to be the buyer and seller of last resort. And when you're sitting on a bunch of digital assets to do that, um, that really makes the accounting and the controls very difficult to, to administer. Um, I think we've evolved in away from that a bit and, and certainly Gemini's business model has been to step away from being the liquidity provider on our exchange and to attract institutional customers who are market makers to come onto our platform, have very quick and um, uh, uh, transparent access to our order book and so that they can provide liquidity on the platform and take us out of the game of needing to to hold a bunch of digital assets to provide liquidity. And that simplifies the overall internal controls and kind of the reliance on this omnibus customer um, uh, accounting you know, situation that's in place. Um, and, and I think that it, that just involves making a very attractive exchange for uh, market makers and other liquidity providers to, to play on. Um, and I think we'll continue to see that more in the future as well. Thanks, Jared. That's very timely as we've received a number of questions from the audience related to SOC reports, in particular related to your firm, Gemini. So shifting gears a bit, I wanted to touch on how the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting, impacting custodians, specifically in scenarios where custodians maintain private keys and cold storage. Nathan, can you elaborate on whether there have been any challenges for custodians during this pandemic with regard to accessing cold storage? You know, Dave, it's a, it's a really interesting question for us because um, we, we went to shelter in place probably, so Anchorage is based in San Francisco. We went to shelter in place for uh, about a week and a half before some of the official orders started coming down. And then what happened was probably two weeks in, two, three weeks into shelter in place, some of our clients started reaching out and asking us, hey, our are your operations going to be affected by the shelter in place order? And it was a bit surprising to us because the way we have built our system uh, doesn't require us to manually go anywhere in order to access clients funds. Our, our notion of storage does not, um, does not take the trade-offs between hot and cold. We have, we've built a secured authenticated system that doesn't require any sort of um, manual travel to a data center or anywhere to say unlock a, a cold storage system. Uh, and so the, our, our mental model within Anchorage is that of course your assets are available and of course us going to shelter in place wouldn't affect anything. And so we're a little taken aback uh, by clients asking us because uh, some of them are cussing with other custodians who are having uh, major operational problems. Um, some of them rolling out um, schedules to say, hey, you can only you can only access your funds at 3 p.m. daily uh, because that's when our, our people are going to go out of shelter in place to go access the funds or things like that. And so it has been uh, has been something that has affected some of the custodians. We, we're fortunate enough to have built our system from the beginning so that we are able to operate uh, totally independently to where we are geographically. Our clients are able to operate totally independent of where they are geographically. 
Uh, but certainly we've heard anecdotally so that some, some folks have had some issues with this, especially some of the, our clients who have a portion of their funds in self-custody still. Uh, they have built uh, internal custody solutions uh, where they're holding their own funds. Uh, and a number of them have actually reached out to us and said, hey, uh, we want to be able to operate totally independently. We understand that Anchorage allows very flexible use cases um, where people are able to authenticate uh, no matter where they are. Can we, can we sign up? Can we onboard? Uh, because we are, uh, we are wanting to update our business continuity plans. Uh, we're wanting to update our um, operational plans to be able to make sure that we can operate in a, in a fully remote environment uh, like so many people are facing these days. Thanks, Nathan. We'll revisit the impact of COVID-19 shortly, as we've gotten a few other questions from the audience on this topic. The next section will cover an assortment of topics. So Nathan, you briefly mentioned earlier that staking as a service is a new option that is being offered. Can you discuss the benefits of staking from the perspective of the customer, the custodian or the exchange, and also the blockchain network as a whole? Sure. So um, staking for, for those who maybe aren't familiar with it, um, staking is roughly similar to uh, Bitcoin mining in, in very broad strokes in that uh, it is the process by which uh, the crypto network is brought to consensus, uh, which is to say it's the, the process by which new blocks are added into the blockchain. Uh, and staking has a lot of advantages, particularly around uh, energy consumption. It is far more energy efficient to bring networks to consensus using a, a proof of stake type system rather than proof of work, which is what you see in, in something like Bitcoin and its derivatives. Uh, and the interesting bit is that uh, with staking, what you're actually doing is taking some of your assets and putting them at stake in order to bring the network to consensus. Um, so miners get paid rewards based on how much electricity they use. Um, stakers get paid based on um, proportional share of uh, the new uh, underlying crypto that is uh, created uh, as a result of the, the staking operation. And so folks who participate in staking are able to prevent dilution of their funds. Uh, if you look at this in the, in the same way that our, the U.S. government right now um, through the, the Fed is printing more dollars, uh, some of the uh, crypto networks out there are issuing new uh, cryptocurrency uh, on an ongoing basis as part of a staking operation. And so clients entirely reasonably want to be able to participate in that so that they can keep up with the inflation in the network uh, and in some cases generate some amount of yield for themselves. Uh, that said, it is a relatively complex operation. Uh, you need to, like I was talking about earlier, you need to be able to use private keys. You need to be able to keep the, um, the staking node synchronized with your custody so solution. Uh, and so many clients actually want their custodian to be able to solve this. Additionally, we're talking to a number of exchanges who want to custody their funds within Anchorage and have us provide staking infrastructure for them so that they can then provide those back to their end clients. Uh, so this is increasingly looking like something that will be done uh, at the custodial layer and that um, it'll be kind of an integrated offering of custodians. So with that in mind, we have, um, we have invested uh, a heavy amount of uh, resources into being able to stake for clients. Um, so clients want to be able to participate in the, in the yield. Exchanges want their clients to be able to participate in the yields. Uh, therefore, it's something that the custodians must do. Uh, there are a few big assets that are doing staking right now. Uh, but if you look at kind of the, the time horizon of uh, 2020 launches, 2021 launches, it's looking like uh, proof of stake is going to be an increasingly important part of the crypto ecosystem uh, and something that every, everyone will need to be able to do. Um, and uh, what's, what's great here is that uh, custodians like Anchorage, and I know others have done this, are, are investing the time and resources in order to be able to um, stake most effectively and most appropriately for their clients. It, in, it in, introduces a slew of complex questions around the treatment of staking gains. Uh, and so is this ordinary income? Is this more like a stock dividend? How do you treat it? Um, and so as, as much as you need to uh, think about getting SOC audits, uh, 
probably many custodians are working with uh, big four auditors to come up with the tax strategy around how they're doing staking as well. Uh, so there's a, there's a, a bunch to consider as you consider how to, how to roll out staking. Another one of those areas that the, the regulators uh, need to get comfortable with, our, um, our regulators themselves have approved us to stake any assets that we want because we kind of showed them the overall model for how we're going to do that. And so we were, that was one of our, our big wins this year was getting kind of um, wide, wide approval to do staking out of our trust company. Uh, so uh, big deal for us. So that, that sets us up very well for uh, being the, one of the custodial providers that really flexibly provides staking infrastructure to its clients. Yeah, staking is definitely a very interesting and complex topic. So thank you for that overview, Nathan. Jared, I recently saw that Gemini announced the digital asset pilot with State Street, combining Gemini custody with State Street's back office operations. Can you elaborate on that program? And do you think that these kinds of partnerships may become more prevalent in the future? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, it's the partnership with uh, State Street um, to develop a pilot program for them is something we're really, really excited about. I think we've talked about um, you know, this, this level of trust in the industry. And certainly there's been kind of a, a pretty wide gap between the traditional financial services industry and the emerging digital assets, cryptocurrency industry. <clears throat> um, and, and we think that this State Street um, example is something that narrows that gap tremendously. Um, and overall, we, you know, we look forward to, um, a, you know, increased amount of participation from the traditional financial services sector. Um, as they get comfortable with our platforms um, and the services we can provide. I think uh, this, will, this will really provide uh, a way for us to demonstrate that, that we can integrate with larger institutions. Um, and so we're really excited about it. One of the things that um, it affords us the ability to do is to really establish kind of a, a reporting relationship. Normally, you know, our custody clients uh, receive reports directly from us. Um, but with an institution like State Street, uh, we can have integration with them so that, that they can still maintain that customer relationship, customer facing relationship reporting as they normally would, uh, but just using us on the back end as a custody solution. Um, so we're really excited about what this means for the industry as a whole. Um, I will say that, that uh, you know, we're going to continue to see more and more uh, institutions getting involved. Uh, it's just a matter of time. And, and um, you know, it's, it's something that we're heavily invested in um, and uh, we're continuing to push on shortening that length of time. Um, so we hope that this can do that. Thanks, Jared. That's a great segue to our next question. So Paul, as the digital asset custodian industry expands to include more traditional financial services firms, what impact do you think this growth will have on the average investor? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So I think the, the theme of trust has come up several times today. So I think, you know, with more traditional players getting involved, I think it sort of perhaps elevates in certain people in the market's view of, of, of that trust thing. So I think what we see in the market is perhaps a generational divide sometimes where the younger generations are more comfortable using these, these startup tech companies and more comfortable with digital assets. And I think as we get more traditional players involved in the market, it might open up doors to some of those older generations who feel more comfortable working with, with, with the legacy players. Um, so, so I think what it's going to do is, you know, we see funds now offering, starting to offer crypto as, as investment options. So once, once that happens, is it's going to make, you know, I think, crypto and digital assets a lot more available to the, to the general public. Um, I think, you know, things like utility tokens, um, other applications of blockchain will become more and more prevalent in the, in the marketplace as well as different solutions um, um, get, get created. Um, so I think overall, I think, you know, we're going to see a migration of, of more mainstream adoption, various uses of, of blockchain technology. Um, and just with the, the more traditional players getting involved, that gives, gives it greater market credence. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Jared or Nathan, one of the questions that's come in from the audience deals with insurance. Uh, so just open it up to either of you in terms of what percentage of assets are typically covered by insurance? And do you think insurance should be mandatory for bearer assets under custody? 
Yeah, I can, I can, I can take a, a quick round at this one, and Jared, you can, you can follow up here. Sure. Um, I think that the the insurance markets are something that uh, probably many people going into crypto custody didn't think that um, they would have to become experts in. Uh, but it, it, it turned out that in order to run uh, run and, and be part of a, a crypto company, you had to become really uh, quite well versed in um, the insurance landscape. Uh, and so here's the here's kind of the brass tacks on the insurance landscape. Um, insurance landscape, there is a um, fixed aggregate supply for uh, interested people to allocate uh, uh, risk insurance to the, the cryptocurrency markets. And the, the total aggregate there is measured in, I would, I mean, Jared, you may have different numbers here, but I would, I would guess it is single digit billions I agree. In, in the total market available uh, to be able to get insurance. Uh, so you, you round up everybody in the world willing to issue insurance. You end up with something South of $10 billion. I trust that everybody on this call wants the crypto market to grow well beyond $10 billion. Uh, we want to be talking about multi-trillion dollar markets here over the long run. Uh, so the, the, clear, the clear understanding that we all have to do business with is there will never be full insurance. It is, uh, it is financially impossible for us to develop systems that have full coverage for all of your uh, crypto assets, uh, because it just it just cannot work that way. Uh, once we get to multi trillion dollar market cap, um, if we if there was some sort of a loss there, that's an insurance payment payment bigger than say Hurricane Katrina or something like that. Uh, so it is it is just the the math simply doesn't work for full coverage. So what, where does that leave you? It leaves you with security. We actually have to build truly secure systems, uh, and segment the system such that any particular breach that might happen. And we do, we do assume after enough time, there may, there may be some sort of a breach of the systems, no matter how well we design them, uh, that, that may happen. Uh, if you segment things and then ensure uh, the, the segments, then you get to something where you, you have an acceptable risk tolerance here that you can, you can, you can expect. Uh, so that is just kind of the uh, the the brass tacks of the situation. What I would what I would add there is that, um, like like Jared talked about a little bit earlier, um, the insurance policies here uh, end up coming from some different markets within the insurance landscape, and they underwrite different kinds of risks. And so what what people typically have in mind is a um, insurance policy that covers hey if the if the custodian loses the assets, uh, the assets are going to be insured. Well, the question is, what kind of loss is actually insured? Is this loss that has to do with the custodian making an operational error? Or is this a loss that has to do with their physical data center um, being destroyed, say in a, in a fire or a flood or something like that? Or does this actually cover what I think people have in mind, which is cybercrime. Someone comes in and is able to steal the keys and uh, as a result of the keys being stolen, um, the, the coverage would kick in at that point. Um, and so it, it's pretty important when you look into the cyber insurance space to get very particular about what is covered and what isn't and when it is covered. Um, some people have coverage for their hot wallet. Some people have coverage for their cold wallet. Um, all insurance um, situations aren't created equally. In the Anchorage case, we, we are fortunate in that we have um, we don't have a hot cold a hot wallet system or a cold wallet system. We kind of have an integrated system uh, and we've got um, cyber crime across all of the life cycle there. So no matter when your assets are with us, uh, they are covered. And that was, uh, that was our uh, kind of big win. I, I guess you would say in terms of getting uh, comprehensive coverage in that case. Um, but nobody is, nobody is going to be able to provide full 100% coverage. And we shouldn't want that uh, because we want the, uh, we want the asset base to grow so significantly that there's, um, it's simply not possible to underwrite that risk. And then it needs to, it needs to come down to the security of the systems. Uh, Gemini has done a bunch of work here though, too. So I want to make sure Jared has some time to talk about some of the stuff they've done. Sure. I'll, I'll just expand a little bit on, on that. Cause that was a great overview, Nathan. Um, 
you know, you, you mentioned um, that there isn't going to be full insurance. Would totally agree with that. Um, and in fact, we've tried that before and uh, tried it in, in the, the debt markets when AIG basically tried to write insurance uh, for every debt instrument out there. Yeah. And guess what happens when everyone comes calling to claim on that insurance? Uh, you have a financial crisis. So, you know, obviously, the, Jared, uh, we got Bitcoin. Yeah, we got Bitcoin out of the financial crisis. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Um, so, what'll come out of that? I don't know, but um, yeah. it, it's probably not a scalable solution. That doesn't mean to say that there isn't room for a tremendous amount of innovation at this point. And 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 we think there is. You know, one of the things that we've done at Gemini is to establish a captive insurance um, company, meaning. We have an entity that uh, is an affiliate of Gemini that is, um, you know, domiciled and licensed in Bermuda to provide insurance. Um, we currently use it, use it as part of our custodian ins insurance. And we think there's a lot more room to iterate off of that. Um, and really what it comes down to is it's risk aversion. So certain customers are going to be very risk averse and willing to pay for insurance and other customers are going to be less risk averse and are going to rely on the security controls that you know we've out, outlined here today. Um, and so the market will evolve in a way that satisfies that sort of spectrum of risk tolerance. Um, and you know we're, we're, we're trying to be at the center of that innovation. Thanks, Nathan and Jared. Uh, Paul, one of the questions that also came in surrounds legal title and custody uh, and whether or not the assets are owned by the exchange uh, or the, the customer themselves. Can you provide some, some overview or insights there? Yeah, sure, Dave. This is a, a key question from, from an audit perspective. Now, who, who has the rights and obligations to the digital assets themselves? So I, I think the question was, you know, is, it, is it usual, is it common to see a, a custody house take legal right and title, but typically, typically not. If you can imagine these custodians who are managing the, the digital assets of multiple companies, um, from an accounting point of view, if they did have the rights and obligations to do that, they would have to bring it onto their own balance sheets, which, which, which wouldn't make sense. Um, we, we do look at this, it's really key to get the legal agreements right up front. So the key questions to ask, you know, who has rights to the digital assets, you know, under the, the contractual arrangement, that just might be a, a user term and condition um, when, you, when you sign up to, to a digital asset exchange. Um, you got to understand, you know, what happens in a bankruptcy situation if this goes to court or creditors get involved, you know, who, who has title to the digital assets. Um, now you look at, you know, things like other third party arrangements, whether the um, digital assets are segregated with the custodian. So, so typically, um, no, the digital asset rights and obligations should remain with you, the individual customer, if it's an exchange or you, the individual company, if you're an entity that that, that has um, digital assets, but it it all comes down to the to the legal agreements, and we encourage a lot of our um, our, our colleagues and our clients to be very very tight on the legal um, descriptions in their in their documents and their, their terms and conditions. I hope that answered the question for whoever submitted it. Thank you, Paul. I know we're coming up on time, so maybe I'll just give uh, each of you maybe thirty seconds to provide some closing remarks. Uh, Nathan, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I think one of the one of the interesting things here is just if we um, if we look at kind of the um, the overall landscape here with uh, coronavirus, um, my my view here is that we have a, a really really interesting opportunity um, to provide uh, new financial infrastructure um, that will in in many ways help alleviate some of the some of the issues that we've seen. Um, either with uh, distribution of wealth or, um, you know, access to financial services over time. Uh, and so I think in, in many ways, the, the whole situation that we're dealing with right now worldwide is a bit of a call to arms to the, the crypto ecosystem. Like, hey, we, we think we have a better plan. We think we have a better, a better way of doing things. Uh, let's execute on it. Uh, let's get this done. And so that's uh, kind of what I'm, I'm consistently telling our team over at Anchorage is like, this is our moment. Um, these, these kinds of world changing events are opportunities for dramatic reconfiguration of how things work. And so let's be thoughtful about how we, how we fit into the, the new world as it, 
as it comes into uh, being in development. Uh, and use this as really a, a way to, to think about how can we how can we maximize Im impact worldwide. So exciting times. Um, appreciate um, Dave and Paul uh, inviting me to this uh, panel. I really appreciate it. And thanks a lot for uh, letting me be here. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. Appreciate you joining. Uh, Jared? Yeah, sure. W would also like to, to thank you both uh, for and EY for, for letting us participate. Um, and always good to be in discussions with, with Nathan. We, we've been in them in the past, and so it's, it's, it's great to get together again. Um, I, I would say we're, we're also extremely bullish. I mean, we're still at the very early innings of cryptocurrency and uh, becoming more of a mainstream asset. Um, a key part of doing that is having custody solutions that are as Nathan said earlier, seamless to, to the user. Um, it's, it's really important to, to have a system that doesn't have any question around uh, if it's going to be secure, if my assets are going to be there um, when I need them. Uh, and it's, it's easy to use. Um, and so, so because we're so early on that, um, we think that there's just the sky is the limit at this point for, for where it could potentially go. Um, and, and we're super excited to be at the early, early innings. Um, uh, I, I think overall, we're going to continue to see the regulatory um, environment evolve. We're going to see certifications around like things we talked about, like SOC 1 and SOC 2 continue to be critical. Um, uh, I noticed uh, Chase had a question around SOC 1. So, hey, Chase, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I think we'll continue to see more and more exchanges pursue that kind of level of transparency as as we climb this trust curve. Um, and and so what that what that's what that means for the the broader industry is that hey we're we're going to have more and more people involved, um, and we're going to need a secure platform and a secure infrastructure to give access to individuals. I just had my um, <clears throat> my parents uh, who are both north of seventy. Um, wanted to get involved in cryptocurrency and help them um, get onboarded to Gemini. And so, um, you know, if, if individuals in that demographic are, are getting involved, then, then I think um, there's really no limits to, to where it can go. So um, thanks for having us and uh, really appreciate the time and, and for the questions from the audience members. Yeah, thank you again, Jared, for joining. Uh, Paul, I'll turn it over to you to wrap it up. Yeah, just, just and just very, very quickly, I think that the two T's to me, trust and transparency, was I think Nathan and, and Jared have mentioned a few times. I think that's what we're here as, as part of the ecosystem to support. So I know we're running up against time, so I'll turn back to my colleague, uh, Paul Grady. Paul McIntosh, thank you very much. I, I, I keep hearing Paul and I, I start up every time. I was like, wow, uh, I, I need to be paying attention. So uh, thank you guys. That was an amazing panel. And uh, thank you for taking the time to join us. We are now going to come back to our guest stars for a little bit of uh, thoughts and commentary. And uh, today, uh, this time, I wanna start with Megan, CEO of Vera Ledger. And uh, Megan, I wanna ask you, uh, give me your thoughts about uh, custody and, and stable coins, and especially, you know, how does this fit, how does maturing custody framework really fit with the, um, the, the original vision of cryptocurrencies as something that people manage themselves? Oh, we lost Megan. How about Lou? Let's go to you for a quick in, uh, uh, first thoughts, and then we'll come back to Megan. Okay. Well, Megan's back. Megan. Oh, I, okay. Megan, you you good to go? Yeah, I'm good. We need to see more of the T-shirt. You're you're you're. I, I'm trying to keep up with you, but it's hard. It seems a, a little, plus. It's more cryptic. We'll leave it out there and see if anybody can figure it out, and I'll let everybody know at the end of the day. Uh, okay. Yeah. So um, I, I'm sorry, I apologize. I missed the last part of your question. No, you know what, just actually share us your thoughts and then we'll go from there. Yeah, sure. So generally, you know, uh, custodianship is an incredibly important thing, right? They are the main liquidity providers in these markets. Um, they make it easy for people to gain access. Um, and, you know, so I, I applaud our, our custodians, right? They, as you discussed before, they make it easier for businesses. Um, for, you know, for larger institutions to get involved, which is all really important. Um, you know, my take is that there always needs to be a balance, right, between the kind of power that custodians have. Um, I think that it's great that we have seen 
uh, these different service providers sort of replicate some of the best practices that we see in securities markets. Um, but you know, we also have these sort of interesting sorts of financial instruments that exist in crypto that don't exist um, you know, in, in, in these other markets. So what I would like to see personally is a little bit more of a consortia effect uh, among custodians to think through, okay, what are the frameworks that we need to be thinking about for uniformly listing and delisting assets? How are we going to be thinking about situations in the future where, we, you know, we distribute airdrops, right? Or this is less in vogue, right? That particular instrument. How do we think about, you know, uniformly distributing staking gains to those who are delegating to us? Um, you know, it's, it's not easy questions to answer. Um, but, you know, they, they do, we have some very industry specific um, sorts of problems that these guys are going to be really critical in, in figuring out how to solve. Um, yeah. And, and Lou, uh, let's get your thoughts real quick. Yeah, well, uh, I thought it was great hearing from them. Obviously, a lot of progress being made. We need a, a great custodianship services to really get the institutional uh, involvement. And so there's a lot of progress going on. Um, I think what they didn't talk a, a lot about though was the, the regulatory environment, because that's another critically important piece to getting the institutions involved. And, and I still think the, the, the regulations of the US are very lacking, which is I think one of the major reasons why this industry is happening much more in Asia uh, than it is here in countries like Singapore and, and Korea and actually even in China. Um, and so, you know, I think that's a real potential problem for the United States. Uh, I was most interested in, and you know, uh, myself in learning about the different services they were offering on the voting and, and the staking side. Um, you know, and I'm actually wearing a t-shirt now from Tezos, uh, so hard to tell trying to up, get up my uh, t-shirt game. Uh, and you know, Tezos is a great blockchain uh, layer one protocol, uh, you know, solving for uh, security of the protocol uh, uh, and for privacy. And so like it's a favorite of security tokens. Uh, and so, uh, and, and one of the things that they're pushing on the staking side uh, is uh, instead of staking, uh, as we think of it today, which is uh, you get kind of a dividend, um, they're thinking of the people, which is probably a taxable event, they're actually uh, thinking of implementing instead of staking, slashing. So for the people who don't stake, uh, actually taking tokens away. And so that can be much more taxably favorable for everybody uh, uh, in the ecosystem. Of course, that would require some level of uniformity about tax rules, which isn't necessarily true around the world, uh, at least not yet. Tell me, um, maybe I'll, I'll come back to Megan. Uh, you know, our, if you listen to the last panel, it sounds complicated, right? This is starting to sound very complicated. Are we um, in, in embracing all the maturity that's required for staking, uh, uh, distributing those benefits and so on? Are we really, are we irrevocably moving away from the era of individual users as custodians? Uh, certainly not. I don't think so at all. Uh, you know, there we're, we're we're missing the infrastructure in a lot of ways, right? But ultimately, for these networks to be able to succeed, you have to be able to have people uh, be their own custodians, right? So, being running your own node, right, for ETH two, right, the ETH two Topaz testnet, right, has just come out four weeks ago, right? It's it's not at the point yet where people can necessarily be out there. You know, your normal like Jane and Joe, whoever can do it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's totally necessary um, and staking really enables, you know, an enhanced level of network security, right? Because more people are going to be able to validate the network than, is, you know, more people are, can mine right now. Um, so certainly think that, uh, you know, at least on staking, um, you know, everybody who ho holds, right, a, a, an ETH2, right, uh, Ethereum ETH, uh, will be an intricate part of network security in a way that they're not now. And the question, and you know, I think future is how is that sort of complexity abstracted away from the user? Uh, and I think we'll see that. Lou, what's your sense? I know you talking before about sort of surveillance and privacy. I know it's, it's, it's a topic that's near and dear to your heart, which is how to preserve the autonomy of individuals who are part of this vast network. Right. Well, I think it's, it's really a question of choice, right? Uh, in order to get institutional involvement, obviously, I think institutions are going to want to you know, have a custodian for those assets. 
uh, and I think you have a lot of other people, uh, I think you know, much more individuals uh, who, are, who are gonna wanna own their own keys uh, and, and have control over that. So I think being able to offer you know, a, a wide array of solutions based on what people want is just another thing that's gonna help the industry grow. Now, in, in the one of the things that's really interesting about the world of, of crypto assets and blockchain assets that's so different from the traditional banking world is in, in this world of crypto assets and blockchain assets, um, especially on the public chain, everything that happens is really public. So whether you are a custodian or an integrated service provider or an individual, you can see all of the underlying technological stuff. Even when you use zero knowledge proofs to conceal kind of the from and the to, you can still see how it's done. Do you think we're ultimately, I, my hypothesis is we're ultimately building through transparency, a much more resilient ecosystem than a traditional financial structure. And I'd love to get your thoughts on that. And, and, and where, where could that go forward and where could it get tripped up? Yeah, so uh, I mean, I completely agree with you. Obviously, we're building something that, that is more resilient for the people who want it, that is far more private, uh, that you can actually you know, hold your assets yourself and take it around the world wherever you go. There's not a person in the middle uh, you know, who's deciding the rules and what's going to happen. You know, when, when we're talking about, um, you know, uh, uh, having custodianship too, we also, you know, there's a level of, of obviously a high level of centralization there also with stable coins, right? If the government wants to come in and take, you know, uh, all of the circles assets because, you know, people are using USDC for illicit purposes, then the government can come in and do that. And so, you know, again, this is about giving people choice. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and so again, for the institution, but they could not, they couldn't seize those assets arbitrarily though. Right. It would be, uh, or let me say they couldn't seize them in, invisibly, right. Doing something like that would, would be highly, highly public. Well, sure. But the government, uh, you know, in my view, the government's a bully. The government is solving for the government, right? If the government was solving for us, we'd have regulations about how all of this could work and, and we'd be much further along. So the government doesn't want people, you know, uh, I think are concerned about people owning Bitcoin, uh, but you know, they're fine with people going down the street and buying a lottery ticket. Hmm, I, that's an interesting point of view. I mean, I, I, I've got my own opinion on that, but Megan, I wanna give you a chance to sort of respond to that because uh, uh, Lou, you've staked out a very controversial point of view and, and those of us who are in accounting and, and professional services our job is to make this uh, uh, legal and viable. And I think it, it may not be happening as fast as some people want, but I think it is starting to happen. Megan? Yeah, I, well, I would say broadly, right? The, to get back to your earlier question, at least, like the, I do think that this is a much more sort of uh, resilient infrastructure that's being built right now. Uh, we see every year, right, financial statement restatements on the order of hundreds of millions and billions of dollars from some of the largest companies because of, you know, back office errors or whatever sort of operational problems you have, right? Um, and there's not a lot of transparency into it, right? And it has ramifications for, you know, GDP, for industry health, all of these things. And so while we may not ever be able to truly like have 100% privacy across networks, we can at least have more transparency into the way that companies behave uh, and, and how industries perform. Uh, that's that's what I would say in response. So, I mean, I certainly think, you know, uh, uh, of, of all the institutions, it's funny, right? I, I feel like of all the institutions that people talk about, I think the Federal Reserve and the independent central banks are actually among the most reliable. The custodians of our currency have the highest level of transparency. They have among the, the most mature kind of independent infrastructure. Uh, I, it, it's interesting that um, so many people distrust this institution, which actually has a, a fairly good track record. Well, I right? think a lot of people have said there was going to be hyperinflation. There wasn't. There wasn't going to. There, there was no hyperinflation after Ben Bernanke invented quantitative easing. Well, right. I think there's a lot of transparency uh, uh, in terms of what happened, what's going to happen next. Uh, there's a lot less transparency on that. And obviously the problem is, is the government can print as much money as it can, right? We, we don't know when it's going to cause inflation, right? Could the government print 5 trillion, 50 trillion? If the government can print $100 trillion, 
Why does the government need to collect taxes from everybody, right? The government can just print whatever money it needs for its services. Well, I, I think there, there might be a lot of people with stuff to lose. I'm sorry, Megan. No, I was just going to say, certainly the Federal Reserve has done its job and brought us through, you know, financial crises in the past. Uh, it's just, is it how, how, yeah, like how will that system evolve, uh, you know, going 